Hi, my name is Sophie. I'm a professional doll maker. Today I'd like to share with you the story of making Josephine and Joseph, the two porcelain dolls with a deep skin tone. It was an exciting and unexpectedly difficult project. Oh no. But we'll talk about all the hardships when we get to it. First, every doll needs to be sculpted. I am using modeling clay and sculpt the face by hand. As usual, I am creating one face for both genders. I start by making the overall shape for the future face. As you can see, I use a template of the back of the head, so all the heads I create are the exact same size. When the base shape is done, I can move on to sculpt the features. When I sculpt the nose and lips, I start with a simplified geometric piece of clay and then carve and reshape it until it looks correct. For the eyes, I have a different approach. I carve them out of clay using a small tool and a needle. The face is sculpted, but we only started. It is far from finished, so I might as well call it a sketch. To make the actual face template, I am doing the following. I make a plaster mold of the clay face, then cast it in porcelain. This will allow me, first, to have a prototype made of a more durable material, and second, I can refine the porcelain cast and make a better template. As you can see, right from the mold the cast is pretty rough so I sand it to make it nice and smooth and get rid of the tool marks. Then I refine the features with a small tool. After another round of sanding, the prototype is almost finished. Look how much better it looks now! All that is left is to fire the head and prime it, and we're good to go. Using this prototype, I made the final plaster mold. This mold follows the shape of my refined prototype, so the cast will be as nice and smooth as possible. All the primary steps are done, and the work on the dolls themselves begins now. To cast the dolls, I need to prepare the porcelain slip. And here comes the biggest challenge of this project. Most porcelain slips only come in one color – white. Some come in a limited range of colors, and a small number, created specifically for doll making, comes in a variety of skin shades. Unfortunately, my all-time favorite parent porcelain only comes in white, and I am going to tint it myself using a ceramic pigment. I measured the required amount of pigment mix it with a bit of distilled water to break up the clumps and pour the mixture into the slip. The color looks much deeper already, but the porcelain only reaches its final color and texture after it's fired in the kiln. I did some tests and saw how the tinted porcelain looks when it's fired, so I'm very excited to make the dolls in this material. To cast the dolls, let's prepare the slip and the molds. I drain the slip through a piece of nylon to get rid of bubbles and any hard components. Then I cleaned up the plaster molds for the bodies and secured the parts with rubber bands. I made the prototypes for the bodies and the molds in one of my previous videos. The link should appear on the screen and I also added it in the description. When everything is prepared, I start to carefully pour the slip into the molds. The two dolls consist of 38 pieces in total, and I cast them all one by one. When the porcelain slip is poured in the mold, plaster starts to soak the water out from it. 
This means that the slip that touches the inner side of the mold dehydrates and becomes solid. As the time goes on, this layer of solid porcelain gets thicker and forms the casts. The slip in the middle does not become solid, so I can pour it out. That's why the casts are hollow on the inside. Now I can carefully open up the molds and see the beautiful casts of the future dolls. Or that's how it's supposed to be. Unfortunately, this time things did not go this smooth. When I open up the molds, more than a half of the pieces cracked or even looked like they bursted. I almost never experienced anything like this. I tried to make the slip thicker and watered it down, I added electrolytes, I dried the molds as much as possible and used them wet, and absolutely nothing helped. Sadly, as beautiful as it is, the slip I made is a nightmare to work with. So, what can be the problem, and how can I fix it? First, it could be the pigment. The one I used is supposed to work with slips, but there might be some kind of conflict between the parent slip and this exact pigment. I can try a different pigment, maybe from a different brand. Second, I can try a different porcelain slip. As for the experiment, I tinted some slip I had on hand, and it worked perfectly well. This slip was yellow, so the color of this test piece is off, but I definitely can try this approach. And last, I can use a pre-tinted slip. I have some ultra chic slip in the color cappuccino. It casts really well and looks great when fired. The problem is I have a very small amount left, and this slip is only sold in the US. Shipping heavy parcels, let alone liquids, from overseas is a huge pain, but I might have to do it. With all of this said, how did I fix this problem? As I said before, half of the cast came out from the molds busted, but the other half actually turned out well. So, after trying many options and realizing I really liked the look of this tinted slip, I persisted and kept trying over and over again. It took a very long time. Some pieces were particularly stubborn. I think I cast the girl's left hip over 20 times. But finally, with pure persistence, I was able to cast all the parts. When I started this project, I was not going to show you the failed attempts, so most of it was not filmed. However, when I realized the scope of the problem, I decided to show you the full story. Doll making and especially working with ceramics can be very unpredictable and frustrating, but it's an inseparable part of this art. With all these difficulties, I will not stop trying. Diversity is one of the goals of my art. And even though it is easier to just use white porcelain, I am determined to find a sustainable way to create dolls in a full range of skin tones. If you have any ideas on how I can improve the slip, please let me know in the comments. I would be very thankful for any advice. When all the parts of the future dolls were cast, I cut slots for the elastics and made holes for metal bars in the joints. This will be necessary later, when I am assembling the dolls. I only cut the pieces when they are still wet. When the raw porcelain is dry, it is extremely fragile and easy to break. When I am done with casting, I can move on to sanding. Right from the mold, the pieces are still a bit rough, they have visible seam lines and lack details. I carefully remove any imperfections and smooth the surface with sanding sponges. At this stage, porcelain is very soft, and if I'm not careful, I can easily send off all the details in the process, so I have to be very light-handed. Sanding creates a huge amount of dust, so I use a vent and always wear a mask. When the initial sanding is done, I move on to finer work, which is adding definition to smaller pieces. Let's start with the faces. With a small tool, I carve the ears and when I'm happy with the shape, I use a wet brush to soften it. Water basically melts the very surface of the raw cast, turning it back into the slip. By doing this, I can get rid of tool marks or rough edges, but if I apply too much water, all the details can dissolve and the piece will be ruined. It is a very fine balance between keeping the piece a bit wet, so it's easier to work with, but not soaking it, so it doesn't break down. Next, I move on to carving the eyes. This part is so tiny that I use a needle instead of a tool.
When I am walking on the nose, I dip the tool in water and then carve the nostrils. This way I keep the porcelain a bit more malleable. Now it's time for the lips. After adding some primary definition, I dip a small brush into some watered down slip and draw a line at the contour of the lips. This raised line is something that most people have, and it adds a lot of realism and expression to the doll's face. I carefully carve away any axis from this line and make sure the lips are symmetrical. Last, I add the tiniest wrinkles on the lips. All of this is done individually for every doll. The smallest details cannot be transferred with a plaster mold, so each doll requires a lot of manual work. And even though I use the same mold, all the dolls are still a bit different from each other. Here you can see how the face looks right from the mold and after all the detail work. When the faces are done, let's move on to hands and feet. As I said before, plaster mold cannot transfer all the details, so the fingers come out a bit fused. I carefully separate them using a needle and a tiny knife. Next, I add folds and wrinkles on the palms. As you can see, I am also using a wet brush to smooth the surface and then the needle again to add definition when the porcelain is still wet. Then it's time to cuff out the nails. Last, I add the tiny wrinkles on the knuckles and on the palms. This was the male hand, the female one got the same treatment. I separate the fingers, carve the nails and add the wrinkles where necessary. And the same applies to the feet. I make sure my dolls have detailed toes and toenails, and even wrinkles on the soles. The last step of refinement is to soft fire the pieces and give them one last round of sanding. Soft fire stands for an intermediate firing in the kiln. The temperature isn't high enough for porcelain to reach its final form, but it strengthens the pieces and they don't dissolve in water anymore. After the soft firing, I soak the pieces in water and wet sand them to make the surface absolutely flawless. Finally, now we can move on to the true transformation. I put the pieces on the bed of silica sand. This is done so the pieces don't deform at the high temperature and place the shelf with the dolls in the kiln. It is time for hot fire. Hot firing is done at the temperature of about 1200 C and it takes approximately 24 hours to complete. 
As the temperature slowly rises, the material of which the dolls are made of melts and completely changes its properties. The clay shrinks and turns from a soft and porous material into solid and heavy porcelain. It is now shining and translucent, and we can finally see its true color I worked so hard for. Even though it was a long journey, much longer than I anticipated, I think the pieces turned out absolutely beautiful, and it was worth all the trials and tribulations. I quickly cleaned the sand residue from the pieces. As you can see, the porcelain is now absolutely waterproof. The pieces are done and prepared for the last step, which will truly bring the dolls to life. It is time to paint them. Porcelain is painted with china paints, which are produced specifically for ceramics. These paints are supposed to be fired in the kiln at about 800 C. At this temperature, the paint is chemically bonded to the surface of porcelain, and it never fades or comes off. The paints come in powder form and are mixed with medium to create the actual paint. I start by applying a small amount of dark paint and blending it out to create shading. It takes a few layers to build up the color. Each of these layers is fired in the kiln to lock it in place. Then I add a layer of white to the eyes and paint a base shape for the eyebrows. The brows are one of the most complex part of the painting. They usually take me 4-5 to five layers to complete. The first layer is fired. Now I add blush to the face using a red shade of paint. I add the blush not only to the cheeks, but also to the nose, ears and lips to make the face look more alive. I am painting both girls' and boys' faces at the same time, and you can see how brow shape is slightly different for the two dolls. Next layer I am painting the base for the irises and start to work on the hairs in the brows. I use the thinnest brush and paint the hairs following the natural pattern in which they usually grow. I will be adding more and more hairs in the next few layers. As you can see, the eyebrow shape for the boy and the girl becomes more and more distinguishable. With the same brush I paint the eyelashes. The lashes are very hard to paint and even harder to film, so please believe me, that's what I'm doing here. The eyes also require a few layers of paint. I add shading around the irises to make the doll's glance expressive and paint the pupils. Last but not least, I paint the highlights. Each doll gets a few sparkles in the eyes and sheer white lines around lips and eyes to define them. As the last step, I decided to give the doll some cute freckles. Here is the finished result. Even though the dolls have the exact same face, I painted them slightly differently. And I think they have very different face expressions and energy.
When the faces are painted, I move on to the bodies. First, I apply a layer of blush on the hands. The same goes for the feet. I cover the soles and the toes with a layer of rosy paint. Then I take a thin brush and paint all the lines and wrinkles with the same rosy shade. Last, I paint the nails and the white areas on them. Then I add shading to every part of the bodies. I place the same dark brown paint I use on the faces, where I want to create a shade, and spread it out with a clean brush. Then I add blush in the same technique. Last, I painted an assortment of birthmarks and freckles. Finally, the dolls are fully painted. They come a long way from a bucket of sleep to a set of refined parts. And it is now time to transform the set into finished dolls. Let's assemble them. To put the dolls together, I need to prepare a few things. Stainless steel wire to put inside the joints, wire cutters, a couple of scissors, assembling thread and tool, and suede to line the joints. Ball jointed dolls are assembled with elastic cord. But before I can assemble them, I first need to prepare the joints. I cut the wire to size and glued the bars inside each joint. This is done to redistribute the elastic. Without it, the joint wants to slide into one of the extreme positions, fully bent or unbent. The wire helps to fix the joints in the intermediate position when needed. Also, the elastic is held inside the doll by attaching it to the bars inside the hands, feet and the head. Next, I added a bit of epoxy sculpt in some joints to make them a bit stronger. Now it's time to line the joints with suede. Scratching porcelain against porcelain would destroy it very quickly, so every joint slot is lined with suede to both protect the joints and make it move smoothly. I carefully glue small strips of suede into the joints, making little darts when needed. For the smaller joints, I just glue in small pieces of suede and trim the excess off. Mm -hmm. 
Now the dolls can be assembled. I slide the pieces onto the elastic like beads on the necklace. The dolls have two elastic cords in each leg and one in both arms. The elastic runs through all the pieces and is fixed in hands and feet with small hooks. Here are the assembled dolls. Now when I look at them, I think all the troubles were worth it. The tinted parent porcelain is incredible. However, we are not done yet. I still need to give this pair hair and outfits. Let's start with the wigs. I make the girl's wig first. To make a cup, I wrap the head template with cloth and apply a layer of glue. I make wigs with hot glue. In my experience, this is the best material. It is very strong and the wigs I make can be styled, washed or even dyed without damaging them. I cut the cup to size and then started to attach locks of hair on the back of the head. I use natural my hair with a curly texture. I glue the hair in rows, moving from the bottom to top, paying the most attention to the front. When I reach the place where I want to make a parting, I cut the wig open and pull a lock of hair through the cut. Then I glue this lock to the cup from the inside. This lock is divided in two parts and brushed down, and that's how the parting is created. To set the hair, I put a piece of cloth over a wet wig. When it dries, the pattern stays in place. Now all that is left is to trim the wig. Here is the finished result. Now let's make a wig for the boy. I made the cup and started to attach the hair, moving from the bottom to top. I wanted to create a shorter wig, about shoulder length. The my hair I'm using is way too long for this, so I'm cutting every lock in half. When I reached the top, I made the pattern in the same technique. When the wig was glued, I started to cut the hair to the desired length. However, I quickly realized it did not look how I wanted. I was going for a fluffy and voluminous look, but the hair was not curly enough. I even experimented with perm on a sample wig, but the curls turned out way too messy, and I didn't like it as well. So I changed my approach and cut the hair short, giving the wig a trendy hairstyle. It was not my original plan, but I think it really suits the boy's face shape. Still, I did not give up on the idea of making a textured wig, so I tried something completely different. I decided to go for a very short wig, almost a buzz cut. I made a paper mache cup, painted it black and covered it with flock. I cannot decide which one of the wigs I like better. I think the boy looks handsome in both of them. So he will be sold with two wigs instead of one, and the future owner can change his looks as they desire. And which wig do you like better? The last thing to do is to create the outfits. I am using a silk crepe, which I am dyeing myself. 
I prefer to buy white silk and mix my own dyes to create the exact shade I want. This time I decided to go for a bright and cheerful yellow. I added a bit of orange to the mix to create a warm shade of egg yolk. First, I created the dress for the girl. I traced my pattern on the fabric and cut it out. Most of my baseline dolls wear the same style of clothes. And for the girls, it is a baby doll dress with voluminous sleeves and a mid-length skirt. This style is inspired by late 19th century teen fashion. When the pattern is cut out, I start to put the bodies together. I first pin the shoulder seam, then base stitch it. The scale is so tiny that I can't rely just on pins. Any dislocation of the pieces will cause a visible deformation, so I always base stitch every seam to keep it in place. When the shoulder seam is done, I start to attach the sleeve. I need to make exactly 7 folds of a certain size on each sleeve, and sometimes it takes a few tries. Again, I base stitch the sleeve and then sew it by hand with a back stitch. Most seams are done by hand, because I need to be extremely precise. When the sleeve is attached, I also finish the row edge by hand. What I am doing here is basically hand surging the fabric. I will show later in detail why I do it this way and what a difference it makes. I sewed the side seam of camera and now I am attaching the collar with the same back stitch. This design has a standing collar made out of two pieces of fabric. The last thing to do before the bodice is finished is to attach the cuffs. The dress has very narrow cuffs, so I make a lot of folds in order to put the sleeve together. I don't like to line the cuffs and hide all the seams inside, because it ends up way too bulky. Instead, I stitch the cuffs to the sleeve, trim the excess fabric and finish the edge. I use fray check on the edge, but then still search it by hand. With this double treatment, the edge is as neat as possible. Now let's move on to the skirt. I cut a big rectangle of the required size and hem the bottom. I base stitch it first, then do a machine seam on the entire hem. Then it's time to gather the skirt. I do this with the help of this scary looking foot. This foot is a bit tricky to use, but it creates very neat folds in the fabric. All that is left is to attach the bodice to the skirt. I first pin the pieces together, making sure that everything is even. Then I base stitch the waist seam and sew it by hand. The machine foot won't fit in there by any means, and by doing the seam by hand I can make it as precise as I want. Now it's time to finish the row edge. I trim the excess fabric and hand search it all the way. The fabric won't fray because I used fray check, but as you can see, the unsearched edge isn't very neat. The fabric goes in all directions, and the seam just looks a bit messy even from the outside. The search edge is much neater and lies flat, which makes the whole piece look better. Last, I attach buttons for closure and make tiny loops out of thread. The cuffs are also closed with buttons and loops.
and the dress is done. Now let's create the outfit for the boy. It consists of a shirt that mirrors the design of the bodice I just made and a pair of trousers. I start by making the shirt. I trace the pattern on the silk fabric and cut it out. I put the shirt in the same order, starting from the shoulder seam, and then move on to attaching the sleeve. As you can see, the sleeves on the shirt are a bit less voluminous, but I still need to create quite a few folds. I backstitch the sleeve seam, trim the excess fabric and serge the edge. The side seam is quite simple, so I did it with a machine, but I still finished the edge by hand. Then I attach the collar and the cuffs. Last thing to do is to hem the shirt. I want to minimize the bulk in this area as much as possible, because the shirt will be tucked into the trousers. So instead of sewing the hem, I am going to use an adhesive tape. First, I created a desired shape and base stitched it in place. The hem of the shirt is curved, so I use a lot of pins. I iron the hem to keep the shape and remove the basting stitch. Now I am placing small pieces of adhesive tape into the hem. As you can see, I move bit by bit and use very small strips. When the hem is done, I attach buttons and loops to the front opening of the shirt and to the cuffs. Next, I made the trousers. I cut the pattern out of dark brown cotton. This fabric is thin but very dense, perfect for something that needs to hold its shape. I basted the pieces together, sewed the side seams with a machine and searched the edges on the inside. After I attached the waistbands, all what was left was to add a button and a loop. The outfit for the boy is finished. The very last thing to do is to make the shoes. I am making two pairs of leather boots. I cut the pattern pieces out of dark brown leather. Then I cut holes in the heel pieces for the laces. The toe pieces are soaked in water and pulled onto the shoe last to shape them. Leather is soft and malleable when wet, and it holds its shape when it dries. I secure the piece with a strip of fabric. When the toe piece dries, I pull the heel piece over it and shape it the same way. When the leather is shaped, I glue the pieces together. 
I also make a stitch in this area to secure the pieces even better, but glue holds the shoe together while I walk. The excess leather at the bottom is pulled down as flat as possible. I use thread to secure it for now. When it's all held in place, I hammer the sole to make the leather lay flatter, then cut the excess off to create a perfectly flat sole. To strengthen the sole, I attach a piece of thin plastic and then cover it with leather. Last, I attach the heel that I made by stacking several layers of leather and painted the size of the heel and sole black to make it look neater. The shoes are done. As a final touch, I replaced the temporary laces with yellow silk ribbons. All the hard work is done and it is time for the reveal. Josephine and Joseph are one of my most special and memorable projects so far. I am very happy with how they turned out and the porcelain shade was worth all the hardships. There is a big chance this will be the only two dolls made from this exact porcelain, but I will continue to experiment with pigments and tinting the porcelain slip. As this video goes live, Josephine and Joseph are available for purchase on my website sofadolls.com. There you can find photos and information about the dolls. My contacts and social media links are in description. For now, I am done with making the twin dolls. For the next project, I'm going to do something more ambitious and exciting. If you have any suggestions on what I should do next, please let me know in the comments. Thank you very much for watching, have a wonderful day and see you next time.